Welcome to GSA Fast Focus, a look at what's happening in and around the U.S. General Services Administration's Federal Acquisition Service. I'm Joan Kornblith. My guest today is Tiffany Hickson, GSA's Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC. She is also the government-wide Federal Professional Services Category Executive. Tiffany, who is based in the Seattle area, also serves as the FAST Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. We're going to learn how Tiffany juggles those multiple roles and about an exciting new program coming out of PSHC. We will also run down some of the webinars and CLP opportunities coming up in the next couple of weeks. And as always, put a few fascinating facts in FAST Focus. Welcome back to Fast Focus, a look at what is happening throughout GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. I am Joan Kornblith. In just a couple of minutes, I'll be talking with Tiffany Hickson about her role as GSA's Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC. But first, do you have a question about PBAs. I'm talking about performance-based acquisitions. That is the method of preparing service contracts that emphasizes the service outcomes as opposed to the manner in which the work is performed. If so, we have got an event for you. It is the next PSHC Office Hours coming up on Thursday, June 10th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. Join Jonathan Evans as he explains the benefits of using PBAs during your procurement planning. This training will earn you one CLP, and it is a great opportunity to get your questions about PBAs answered. I am talking about the next PSHC Office Hours Understanding Performance-Based Act acquisitions coming up on Thursday, June 10th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. More info available at gsa.gov slash events. The date again, Tuesday, June 10th, and everything begins at 1 p.m. Eastern. That is 10 a.m. Pacific. Welcome back to Fast Focus, a look at what's happening in and around GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. I am Joan Kornbluth, and today we're welcoming Tiffany Hickson to Fast Focus. Based in the Seattle area, Tiffany is GSA's Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC, and she is also the government-wide Federal Professional Services Category Executive, and she also serves as the FAS Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. Welcome to the show, Tiffany. And can you unpack all of those titles for us? <laughs> yes, I can, Joan. Um, but first, thank you so much for having me on on fast focus, uh, it's always such a pleasure to spend time with you, um, Thank you. And, and to share information about the great uh, work my organization is doing. So, yeah, when I take a moment to think about those titles, I think at the heart of it is an example of um, like true efficiency, right? And from a fast perspective, just to have someone be like, have three different hats, three different roles. It's an exercise in efficiency. <laughs> think about it. But in all seriousness, um, I think my responsibilities are really a reflection of what FAST does um, and its leadership role in government um, and really the agency's thoughtfulness uh, in terms of how it really leverages uh, its senior leadership talent. Um, the organization um, I lead manages the only government-wide contracts for professional uh, and human capital services. Um, so that's really what the assistant commissioner role is about. Um, and that includes um, categories of spend that we manage through GSA's multiple award schedule contract, the OASIS, HCAT's uh, best in class, multi-agency contracts, um, and GSA's smart pay financial services program uh, that manages the federal government's purchase travel and fleet cards, um, which is also a best in class program. So uh, in all, with my from an assistant commissioner view, um, we uh, manage and oversee the use of a little over 6,500 contracts uh, that provide those services to federal agencies, um, a little over 5 million uh, card accounts through our smart pay program, and about $50 billion a year annually uh, in, in federal spend that we help agencies um, really deliver those mission services right through those contract programs. So that's what I do with my assistant commissioner hat on. 
Um, and because GSA is the only agency that has government-wide contracts in this space, um, it was a pretty natural fit um, for OFPP really to see us as the leader in the professional services category space. Um, and so I was lucky enough, in my view, uh, to be appointed as the federal category executive for professional services. Um, and it, it's because we have the only government-wide contracts, it's really easy, right, for me to integrate that role. Um, it aligns neatly to what GSA's responsibilities are, um, and which is really about let's how do we do good um, services contracting. Um, and I, I see myself as really, you know, the the cheerleader in chief, right, um, in mm -hmm. terms of doing good services contracting um, and helping agencies uh, to do that work better. Uh, we do that through our contracts and we all also do that through a number of other um, acquisition tools um, that agencies use. So um, really it's, it's kind of part and parcel of the work that I do as an assistant commissioner. And then lastly, um, I am uh, a regional commissioner as well. Um, and th that's a pretty easy fit. My office is, organ uh, is headquartered uh, in the Northwest, uh, in the Seattle area, as you mentioned earlier. Actually, our office is currently in Auburn, Washington, um, but we're gonna be moving to Tacoma uh, in, in January of 2022. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? That we're already looking at 2022, but we're gonna be moving uh, to it's Tacoma. It's only six months from now, or, or no, five and a half. It's just crazy. Um, time flies when you're locked up <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. Uh, it's been a, a journey, for, but in any event, looking forward to, to that move. But um, you're like, hey, why the Northwest? Why Seattle? Well, um, FAS actually has about 175 employees that are located in the, the four state footprint of the Northwest Arctic region. The majority of those employees are actually in my organization in the Puget Sound area. So it's a, a pretty easy fit for me to represent FAS uh, in all of the work that, that we do for federal agencies here in the Northwest because I'm here. Speaking of that region, before we go any further, you are to date uh, our only guest to be raised in Alaska. How did you get to GSA and the world of procurement? I like to say from the wilds of Alaska yeah. to the wilds of federal procurement. <laughs> See, I mean, I I left that wide open so you could just drive right, right through, through it. it. Yeah, <laughs> and happy to do so for you, Joe. Happy to do so. Um, it's it's a long story, um, but you know, like other, uh, what I view as other leaders, right in in uh, federal acquisition. I started as an intern, um, so I I left my hometown in Wrangell, Alaska, and moved to Seattle to go to college. Um, and while I was studying at Seattle University for my degree in political science, I also had a, a strong uh, relationship with the School of Public Administration, and it was the mid to late 80s um and you know i really needed a job um and so noah uh, was recruiting for uh interns and i threw my hat in the ring and got hired for by the national oceanic and atmospheric administration which is under the department of commerce and that's really what started my my career i had a, a and still do have an incredible passion for public service as well as procurement um, and it just was a great fit. Um, and, uh, you know, I now I think I have 32 years in uh, federal acquisition. Um, and a big chunk of that was spent uh, with uh, 15 years in all uh, at the Department of Commerce, uh, both the field and at headquarters. Um, I moved to the Department of Homeland Security um, during its stand up years and was there for about eight years um, and then moved to GSA. Um, actually moved from DC back to GSA here in the Pacific Northwest and have been with GSA for a little over nine years. Um, and I remain, I like to say, a, a procurement geek. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> I just love it. I love what we do. And, you know, the mission of, of FAS um, is just squarely uh, in, in my passion space, so to speak. So if somebody is is not a procurement geek. What is your little tiny elevator pitch about what procurement is all about? I mean, is it as simple as just buying and selling? No. It's like maybe yes and no. But in federal procurement, it's no. <laughs> and what I really love about uh, federal procurement is you are right in the middle of almost every 
mission space, right? The work that you do touches mission, it touches program, it touches law. It's like, I don't have a law degree and I'm sure our office of general counsel will be rolling their eyes back in their head right now with <laughs> me saying this, um, but there's a, it's very legal, right? Your focus really on, on contract law. Uh, you have to understand budget, finance, personnel, believe it or not. Um, and so you really are at the center of a, a number of mission support functions across government and you'll learn a lot. And you have the opportunity to really help programs deliver um, their mission more effectively. I mean, it's just a great career field to be in and it can really parlay into anything. So you could start in procurement um, and 15 years into your career, go to, you know, the program side of the house or go into budget or go into finance. Um, it's just a really exciting career field to be in. So we yeah. could have the tagline procurement a lot more interesting than it sounds. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, it, it's fascinating. I'm, I've been watching um, and now with, a, I think, with category management, right, and using those principles um, in, in the federal government space, it's been interesting to see uh, private industry and who they're recruiting for. Um, and some of the, the biggest known companies that we know that you may not think would be recruiting uh, federal procurement professionals are. Um, and, you know, they're looking for, you know, those federal procurement skill sets as well as the category management skill sets that we're starting to fold in the work we do. It's been pretty fascinating to watch that evolve over the last couple of years. So it's um, I always say if you've got a, a background in procurement, literally you can walk out, you know, if you were in D.C. or anywhere there's a federal presence, just walk outside and raise your hand and say, I'm a federal procurement professional and someone will probably offer you a job. <laughs> Don't spread that word too far because you don't want to be losing any staff members anytime soon. Well, uh, we're you, really we're really lucky on on that front at GSA. You know, we continue to be um, you know, in, in the top 10 great places to work in government. Very right? true. So we have a, a lot of folks that are actually looking to come here, which is, you know, we're also very lucky. Before we hit the record button, we were talking about distractions and and issues that sometimes come up working at home. I don't know if you can hear the birds in the background at all. No. There, there, are, there seems to be a bird fight or something going on mm -hmm. outside of my house because I keep hearing it pop up in my headphones. There are true angry birds outside, and I hope that it's not true <laughs> too distracting for anybody. Um, we have been billing the show this week as a chance to talk about a new contract that's on the way. But let's take a look at the big picture first. What is happening in your world? Bring us up to date on some of the news from your region out west and in the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories. Yeah, I think I'll start with before we start talking about what's new and coming up, which is always, you know, exciting to talk about. Um, we've really accomplished a lot uh, in the last several fiscal years. Uh, most of the work that we do, right, is at a very, it's a government wide level. It's very strategic. Um, so it generally takes a little time to get through. Um, and I'm just so pleased with the progress that we've made in improving um, our, our, our best in class contracts. So I'll start first with the uh, OASIS. In uh, 2018, the Federal Category Management Leadership Council um, asked us to expand the industrial base um, on OASIS. When OASIS was originally awarded, it was before uh, category management, before best in class contracts, uh, and it really wasn't designed to meet really the goals right, that OFPP and the Office of Management and Budget had had for us in terms of you know these best in class contracts, um, and. It had a number of those features um, and features that we have and enhanced. But once it became a best in class contract, you know, the, the big feedback that we got from federal agencies is, you know, my industrial base isn't necessarily represented on the contract. So can you do an expanded on ramp? Um, and so we began that work uh, in, in 2018 in response to that ask. And, you know, two years. 2,351 questions, 1,600 <laughs> proposals, and 730 contracts later, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it, it's a, uh, it was a big lift, um, but we were really pleased to be able to meet that need, you know, for the federal government while the contract um, gets through its final ordering period between now and, and 2024. So um, we also, uh, as part of that work, in addition to the on-ramps, we did establish a new version of the OASIS contract program, which is OASIS 8A. Uh, and so we ha now have 164 brand new 8A contractors available for agencies to use and finished um, really all of this work uh, up in uh, late November. So a huge, huge accomplishment for the organization. And we're, we're glad to have it largely behind us. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, now the, the hard work really begins, right? With uh, that many new uh, industry partners, we have been spending quite a bit of time over the last quarter um, having, you know, industry days. And it's a good thing that we're virtual because we're able to meet um, with all those industry partners at the same time um, and getting them introduced to uh, agencies that use uh, the OASIS contract heavily, uh, getting them trained up on the reporting requirements, which are, you know, particular to best in class contracts. Um, so, you know, the award was uh, an important milestone, right? But getting them um, settled in to the contract program and agencies using them is really the key focus for us right now. Uh, and through, really through the end of this fiscal year to get them, get them settled and up and running. Are those virtual industry days, um, you know, that's something that we didn't really think about as being a plus before. We preferred sometimes doing them in person more because we thought that personal touch was a big thing. But the virtual ones sprung out a little bit more during the pandemic. But I think that they may stick around because they're proving to be so useful and successful. They are. And I, we had actually started because of cost considerations mm -hmm. before COVID rotating our industry days. So one year uh, we would have uh, an industry day. And this is for we did a combined industry day for um, all of our contract programs, HCATS, OASIS and our multiple award schedules programs. And um, we're really rotating one year in person. This That's where we were headed. Uh, one year virtual. And the benefits of the virtual, in particular for small businesses, is that they didn't have to pay. Right. To mm -hmm. Somewhere. Not all companies are located um, uh, in uh, the national capital area uh, coming out to Seattle, uh, where we have a lot, not all, but uh, a good number of our contracting officers isn't always affordable, you know, for small businesses mm -hmm. either. So that was a huge benefit. Um, you know, the downside to your point is you don't have that person to person interaction. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that when we're we're over, right, um, COVID, and at some point that will happen, um, uh, that maybe we look at really kind of a balanced approach, right, where we rotate, do virtual and do in-person. Um, but the virtual has been very popular. Well, another big bit of news out of your domain is the new services contract that's being established, uh, specifically what's being called the Services Multi-Agency Contract, or MAC. What is this new services MAC that I'm hearing about? Well, we started work this last year uh, in, in really thinking through what our next IDIQ contract needs to look like um, and be. And we need a, a new contract. Um, we can mm -hmm. talk about that in a few minutes if you'd like. Um, but really, and we have not named this particular contract yet. Um, and so our team is working on actually thinking through uh, with your office, actually the Office of uh, Strategic Communications uh, and working through what we should call it. Um, but right now we're just referring it. If you if folks hear about it, we're referring to it as a, a services map or multi-agency contract. And uh, we are looking to establish a, a very broad services IDIQ contract that's available for all agencies to use, uh, and that meets uh, the best in class contract criteria. Um, and we, we, there's a, a lot to unpack in terms of what we're trying to achieve there, but in a nutshell, that's what it's about. I'm Joan Kornblith. You are listening to GSA Fast Focus. If you've got questions about anything you're hearing today or somebody that you'd like to hear featured on the program, just send us a note. The email address is gsafastfocus at gsa.gov. That is G-S-A-F-A-S focus at gsa.gov. Today we are talking with Tiffany Hickson, triple titled here at GSA. She is the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and 
Human Capital Categories, or PSHC, and the Government-Wide Federal Professional Services Category Executive. And she also serves as the FAS Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. Now, Tiffany, let's talk some more about the new Services MAC. Why do you need this? Because yeah, I know what a big deal it is for GSA to stand up a new services contract or really any big contract. This is not something that just happens overnight. No, it does not. And, you know, <laughs> we really are in a, a, a three year cycle, probably about two and a half years before we're going to have the contract ready for use um, for federal agencies. But, you know, simply put, our OASIS contract is uh, its ordering period expires uh, in 2024. Uh, and for all big government wide contracts, because it takes a number of years to get them done, um, we're working on that now. Um, and it really is an opportunity, in, in my view, to build from the ground up a new IDIQ contract that really meets the needs of federal agencies um, and is a best in class contract from the get go. When OASIS was originally established, it was targeting a very specific uh, set of requirements, a very specific part of the industrial base, and it came before the advent, right, of what OMB really wants us to do with our government-wide contracts. So this is a wonderful opportunity, in my view, with OASIS expiring to really establish something um, that's going to better meet the needs of federal agencies with their services contracting needs. So to reiterate, the OASIS <laughs> ordering period is coming to an end. Yes. Is this contract going to take the place of OASIS? In part, um, it will take the place of OASIS, but really we're based on what we've heard from federal agencies, we're going to be expanding the scope of this particular contract to include um, any services that uh, an agency may need. We're not going to have all of those services on contract initially, but we want to build the contract with enough flexibility and scope that as federal agencies needs uh, evolve over time, um, we can add new services, what we're calling domains, um, under the contract. So it's going to be much broader uh, than the current OASIS contract. I'm Joan Kornbluth, and you are listening to Fast Focus from the U.S. General Services Administration. I'm talking with Tiffany Hickson. She is the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC, at GSA, and the Fast Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. Our subject now is the Services MAC, or what's being called the Services MAC. How is this new services contract going to be different from the GSA multiple award schedule, and also OASIS. And also, what are your goals for it? Okay, lots to unpack there, Joan. Yes. Because we have got a lot of goals. <laughs> so we're going to this I'm, to I'm throwing this. it all at you at once. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to talk through it. Okay. Um, and, and first, let's talk about really, you know, it's, and this is true for all of our GWACs uh, and MACs. We have a, a suite of them, right, on contract now. Mm -hmm. um, and really how they are used vis-a-vis -vis our multiple award schedules program. And our multiple award schedules program is directly targeted at commercial products and services. Um, it has got very um, defined pricing types uh, and it is intended really for those highly commercial services and products. Um, our GWAX and our multiple award contracts um, have a much broader scope um, and can provide um, really a full range of services. And those are included both commercial and non-commercial, um, as well as all contract types. So this is like some of that procurement geek stuff that we talked about earlier <laughs> is um, all contracting types, which is really important to federal uh, acquisition professionals. And that ranges from fixed price to cost reimbursement, time of materials, labor hour, you name it, right? Our, our Max and GUX can do that. And it's a big differentiator uh, between um, those government-wide contracts and our multiple award schedules program is that you can buy both types of things um, under our multiple award contracts. And they have a slightly different industrial base as well. Um, and so we've got a number of uh, companies that really target um, and are really just part of the whole GovCom community and don't do a lot of commercial work outside of the government space. Um, so you see a lot more of those service providers on our government-wide contracts versus our multiple award schedules 
contracts. There's some industrial based overlap, but um, there's a there's a difference right between those industrial bases. Um, and the other unique feature uh, for our multiple award uh, contracts versus mass is we really tailored the source selection criteria uh, to address what agencies are telling us they need from their industrial base. Um, and it, for the multiple award schedules program, it tends to be more, um, here's the, the criteria, here's the basics for participating in commercial products and services for the federal government in our multiple award contracts. Um, it is really tailored to what agencies are needing um, from highly qualified contractors that provide you know, both commercial and non-commercial services. So uh, there's a distinction with a very important difference in terms of how agency um, acquisition professionals use those contracts contracts and what they expect mm -hmm. from them. So that can be more specific also. Oh, absolutely. Um, so it's very tailored um, in some instances, and we expect that for our new services, uh, multiple award contract as well. Um, we will, what we're calling domains, um, each mm -hmm. domain we think are, is going to have very tailored um, source selection criteria um, that really reflect what federal agencies are telling us that they need. What are you trying to do specifically with the services, Mac? I think we're trying to meet the federal government's, you know, services contracting needs, right? Um, <laughs> right. And, <laughs> as a, as a, from just a, a pure mission perspective. And what we learned from OASIS in terms of what wasn't working for our existing, I mean, OASIS was the only professional services government-wide contract in government. And what wasn't working, there was a lot of things that worked about it. What wasn't working is that the scope was too tailored. It was, it was too narrow. It was just on professional services. And what that means is that if an agency had a requirement that was largely non-professional, that really was leveraging uh, labor uh, that was covered by the Service Contract Act, or we had work that included Davis-Bacon work or Wash Healy work, again, highly technical procurement <laughs> geek stuff here, um, they weren't able to use the contract. Um, and so since the inception of um, our OASIS contract program, we have been doing scope reviews and we still do those for agencies today and are keeping have been keeping track of how many times we've had to say, nope, you can't use OASIS for you know this service requirement. And so we've learned a lot and we want this new contract to have a much broader scope. Uh, so our contracts are meeting federal agencies needs. Um, every time that we have to say, no, you can't use our contract, is means that we're really not fulfilling our mission, right, from a GSA perspective. So primarily, we're looking to achieve that, right? We've got a contract that agencies can use. Second, we've learned a lot about on-ramps um, mm -hmm. and that they're really hard. Um, I don't really see us using uh, that, that particular feature um, in our new contract. We're still working through that, but I think we're looking to have vetted open enrollment, which means that it's open all the time. Um, that's actually a best practice that we've learned from the multiple award schedules program. Um, and we think that we're going to be able to establish um, a process by which we can have it open all the time. So as industry becomes capable or they're meeting the standards or we've got new entrants right into mm -hmm. uh, the federal market, uh, they're able to come in and, and get on contract. And I think that's going to be a really important feature uh, for small businesses in particular. Um, and it will also help us be more efficient uh, and in really getting companies on contract in a timely manner. Um, and what else? Um, we really want to make sure that we've got adequate small business and socioeconomic participation. I think we achieved that um, in, our, in our OASIS contract programs, but I think we can do better. And so we're going to be talking to the Small Business Administration and other small business leaders uh, in government to make sure that we structure this contract in a way that really has um, well-qualified small business and socioeconomic industry partners on contract and that we have enough of them um, in the right way, right, to meet federal agencies' needs. So that's going to be a key focus for us. And then, of course, ensuring that comp task order competition is, is well-managed um, and that the pricing is really happening at that level. So we're looking at using some new uh, authorities uh, that GSA has uh, to really set pricing at the task order level. And with that, it's going to, I think, require us to provide a lot more pricing data uh, for uh, our 
acquisition professionals to be able to say, hey, here are the prices that we're getting at the task order level. Here's some pricing data that we can use to do that price analysis, cost analysis, that kind of thing. So we're looking to really provide a lot more data and tools for uh, acquisition professionals when they're using this contract, which is we don't have that on Oasis today. I'm really intrigued about the process that you're going through for setting something like this up. I mean, it does sound like an awful lot of work and you're just getting started. Well, you're not just getting started because from what you just told us, you've been tracking the entire time that you've been on Oasis, how things are working, what's be, what is missed, what's not missed, all the steps. Tell us a little bit about the how that uh, in setting something like this up. I mean, it's not just a case of sitting down and creating in a vacuum. Um, What is considered and how do you get the industry and customer feedback, especially during a pandemic? It's been easier than you think it would be. Um, (laughs) I think, you know, technology, right, has really helped us um, stay connected, um, really from a whole, you know, perspective. Um, But let me start first with, you know, in my view, Um, Just building it and they will come, right? Build a contract and maybe someone will show up and use it is really not an effective way to stand up contracts. It doesn't work that way anywhere else. It it shouldn't work that way, right, Um, at GSA either. And to your point, doing that in a vacuum really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, If agencies aren't using our contracts, in my view, we're not doing our job. So the work that we are doing right now is incredibly, incredibly important in terms of setting up a a contract that agencies need and will use. Otherwise, really, what's the point? Um, And so in January, we really started that work in earnest um, and have done um, from both an agency perspective and an industry perspective, we're running two separate um, really engagements Uh, First, with uh, agencies to understand, one, we have a pretty good insight into what they're using our contracts for and what they're not using our contracts for. And so we've been having a series of discussions with leaders uh, across government about uh, what they need and what our contracts aren't doing, you know, for them. So we can, you know, really structure this contract to achieve those goals. On the industry side, we're asking the same kinds of questions, but really through that, that industry lens. And so to date, um, we have received and we've done workshops, um, focus groups, industry days, formal requests for information, you you name it, you know, we have done it uh, in terms of starting to get feedback. We're not done yet, um, but starting to get feedback. And so to date, we have had formal engagements with uh, 10 agencies, along with buying offices under those 10 agencies. We have talked to and received feedback from over 1,800 uh, businesses uh, and acquisition professionals, and we have sorted through every single bit of feedback that we have gotten. Uh, We have engaged with every major industry uh, association and have started dialogues with them. As a matter of fact, um, today I'm getting an outbreak from uh, ACT-IAC on their feedback around what they would like to see in this new um, contract. Lots of feedback from the Coalition for Government Procurement (laughs) <laughs> and we're starting to meet with some other small business associations. And so, you know, it is full steam ahead in terms of really understanding the challenges uh, that agencies have. How do you structure a contract in a way to achieve those and ensure that industry really is able to participate in the contract in a way that is not burdensome, right? So we're in the middle, really, of those conversations. Can you, um, you know, dish a little bit more and share a little bit any other tidbits about what customers in industry are saying? Yes, I can. I can, Joe. <laughs> um, and it, the pretty consistent themes uh, across um, that we're, we're hearing from both groups. From customers, uh, we've learned that uh, customer agencies find really the current availability of best in class contracts for services pretty limiting, and we need to address that issue. Um, So a lot of what I talked about earlier is about that. It's about the scope and then baking in terms and conditions into the contract that allow that to evolve over time. Um, What what has happened uh, previously with our contracts is we say, here are the terms and conditions and that's it. Can't be changed. And the minute that you award the contract, of course, something changes. 
Um, and so we need to figure out how to way, a, a way to legally, right, you know, have a contract that uh, allows us to change the scope and evolve the scope over time. So we're working through how to, how to meet that challenge. Um, also, customer agencies want to be able to find their incumbents, um, and it, not so award can go to the incumbents, but where you have an incumbent that has been successfully performing, you want to make sure that they've got an opportunity to compete for the follow-on work. Um, and so sometimes moving to you know a, a best-in-class contract that doesn't represent your industrial base, well, you're shutting out all those really great contractors uh, that have worked really hard um, to support their mission. So they really want us to be able um, to structure this contract in a way where you know their industrial base is there, it's easy for them to get on the contract so they can compete for work in the future. Um, and you know the agency can also get the benefit of a best in class or really you know, spend under management uh, contract. Um, in addition, uh, we've, long heard from contracting officers that they really need direct visibility uh, into, into industry capabilities. Um, this is really so they can satisfy their socioeconomic goals for the agency, small business utilization, getting that information to the tools that we currently have today, I think everyone would agree is pretty challenging. Um, and so what we'd like to set up in this new contract is something that is really um, data driven, that you can go to a website portal and say, I've got this service, please tell me, dear system, right, or dear GSA, um, what the specifics are about how many small businesses, uh, or veteran owned, let's say, small businesses there are. Um, where are they located? What are their capabilities? What kind of work have they done? Um, and really automate that market research um, responsibility that contracting officers have. It's a huge area of focus for us, and it's really something that we've heard uh, agencies want. Uh, they also would like to have more information around pricing. So we've got our calc pricing tool, right, which is a great data visualization tool uh, for awarded labor rates on our multiple award schedules program. Um, but they really would like to see that married up against prices paid information that we've been collecting over time. And so um, part of another part of the organization in FAST, um, our Office of Enterprise Strategy Management is working on um, actually publishing um, a tool or updating really the calc tool uh, to provide really kind of full scope pricing information uh, that agencies have asked us for. So another big, big want. Um, and lastly, of course, customers want to be able to shorten acquisition timelines, right, as mm -hmm. much as possible. And so a lot of the tools uh, that we want to provide, whether they're what I call acquisition playbooks, um, or if you go to our website today, um, you'll you'll see them there, which is really a toolkit for like if I need to do an order under mass or an order an order under this multiple award schedule or this multiple award contract. Here's like a whole kit, right? In terms of here's a sample statement of work. Um, here is a sample independent government cost estimate. Uh, here is a sample request for quote. Really, you know, provide those types of tools along with the analytics uh, to really help facilitate um, customers buying off of our contracts. And we're really, you know, hearing from customers that that's what they want. Um, so we're working on that. And from industry, you can talk about that too if you'd like. Jill. Yes, sure, sure. Give us a little, give us a little peek in that okay. direction. Little peek. Uh, so what we've heard from industry um, is pretty consistent as well. So they really want to be able to participate in, in best in class contracts on a regular basis. Um, waiting for on ramps, um, having limited opportunities right to get on the contract has been an area of concern for industry and one we're really trying to thoughtfully work through. So, you know, how do you balance the needs of federal agencies and what they want on a contract with access? Right, which is really what industry wants. Um, they would also like to see standards that are considerate of small businesses and um, don't give unfair advantage uh, to large businesses, just being frank. Um, <laughs> this is you know, exactly what we've heard from small businesses on a pretty regular basis. There have also been concerns around the scoring method uh, that we have used on some of our contracts and that perhaps it's not... Um, fair to small businesses in terms of how they have been structured. Um, also, and this is something that we learned um, on Oasis, is when a small, if you're on the contract and you size out from being a small business, um, we had some on-ramp 
mechanisms in the contract um, that we had hoped that when small businesses sized out, they could go to the unrestricted contract vehicle. And that didn't really work out the way that we had hoped it would. So we're looking to fix that um, on our new contract, which is if you're successful and you size out from being a small business, the reward should be you get to stay on the contract, um, not that you're out of the contract. So we're figuring out how to um, really a- address that need. I'm Joan Kornfluth. This is Fast Focus, and we are talking today with Tiffany Hickson. She's the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC at GSA. She is also the Fast Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. We are just about out of time. I do want to ask you one more thing, two actually. What is the next step in this process, and when do you hope to have the contract in place? So next steps um, are we, this year, this fiscal year, uh, we're gonna continue to do market research and engagement with industry associations, um, the Small Business Administration, um, as well um, as our customer agencies to really make sure that we have an, an understanding of what their needs are. In the short term, um, we're going to be issuing another request for information uh, to industry in June, and then we'll be holding a second industry day to talk about the results of that second RFI. Um, And by the end of the summer, uh, we're looking to have our acquisition strategy um, approved, we hope, uh, so we can issue a draft um, request for proposals, um, or RFP, uh, at the beginning of the next fiscal year for comment. And we expect that we'll probably have at least two uh, of those draft uh, solicitations, if not more, um, out um, in probably the first six months of FY22. Uh, And our goal um, is to start awarding new contracts uh, under that solicitation uh, by the end of FY22 and with agencies start to start using the contract in FY23. We have been talking with Tiffany Hickson, the Assistant Commissioner for GSA's Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC. She is also the government-wide Federal Professional Services Category Executive and serves as the FAS Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10. If you have any questions for Tiffany about this new Services Mac or would like to learn more about anything we talked about today or just want to drop us a line, the address is gsafastfocus at gsa.gov. Coming up, news of another great training opportunity and some fascinating fast facts. I am Joan Kornbluff and you are listening to GSA Fast Focus. Welcome back to Fast Focus, a look at what is happening throughout GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. I'm Joan Kornbluth, and as always, we have got a full plate of Fast-specific webinars and trainings coming up. I am joined now by our producer, Max Stempora, who is here with some information about another training specifically for people interested in OASIS, one of the programs that Tiffany was talking to us about. Am I right about that, Max? That's right. And this is always a popular one. OASIS Delegation of Procurement Authority. The next one is scheduled from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Monday, June 21st. Join the OASIS Program Officer for an overview of the program and Delegation of Procurement Authority training. This is specifically for warranted contracting officers. Remember, you must complete this training before requesting a DPA, which allows direct access to OASIS. Visit www.gsa.gov events to sign up and learn more. And of course, I will take it from here again. The webinar scheduled for 1 p.m. Eastern on Monday, June 21st. That is noon central, 11 a.m. Mountain, 10 a.m. Pacific, Monday, June 21st. What you are working virtually from Valdez, Alaska for the summer, that is okay. For you, the DPA training gets underway at 9 a.m. Wherever you are, just remember to visit gsa.gov events page at www.gsa.gov slash events to learn more and register for the next Oasis DPA training session that is coming up on June 21st. I'm Joan Kornbluth, coming up on Fast Focus, a few fascinating fast facts. Welcome back to GSA Fast Focus. I am Joan Kornbluth. We are almost out of time for today. I do want to leave you with just a few fascinating fast facts. 
And since we were speaking with Tiffany Hickson earlier, GSA's Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories, or PSHC, and also the government-wide Federal Professional Services Category Executive, as well as the FAS Regional Commissioner for GSA's Region 10, I thought it might make sense to talk about things related to all of those items. Don't you think so, Max? I do. Okay, well, let's start by digging into Oasis. You know, it's the multiple award contract that's all about flexible and innovative solutions for complex professional services. Oasis Unrestricted is a full and open contract. Oasis Small Business or Oasis SB is a 100% small business set-aside contract with the ability to do socioeconomic set-asides at the task order level. Uh, Given the total sales volume to date since day one in 2014, is 36 billion with 20.8 billion of that from unrestricted and 15.3 billion uh, being Oasis SB. Do you want to take a guess at the dollars obligated in FY20 for Oasis Unrestricted? And I have to tell you before you start you know, making scratches on the paper in front of you, I have to tell you it was a pretty good year despite the pandemic. Oh, okay. Uh, so you said it was... 36 billion since it started? Yep, since day one, 36 uh, billion. Okay, um, how many years would that be? Seven, so... And oh. it was that, yeah. So maybe that's about 5 billion a year? So I'll say 5 billion. You are pretty close. Uh, for fiscal year 20, total number of task orders for Oasis Unrestricted was 165, and that is up from fiscal year 19 total 5.5 billion up from 5.04 in fiscal year 19. Oh, so all right, that's a pretty good guess. Pretty, pretty good. And we may surpass that this year because to date, through the second quarter of this year, business volume for Oasis Unrestricted is 2.2 billion. At this time last year, that figure was 1.9 billion. So things are going yeah, pretty well this year. growing. Yeah. Now, other interesting stuff out of Region 10. Before I go further, have you visited Seattle? Have you been out there? I have. Have you gone out on the river at all, taken the ferry anywhere? Uh, We didn't. We didn't. Okay. Well, go out there again. Next time, keep an eye out for the new fireboat patrolling the area because one of the largest state and local buys so far in FY21 has been with Washington South King County Fire Department. They purchased a fireboat to patrol the shores of the Puget Sound from Federal Way to downtown Seattle. Any idea how much a fireboat like that might cost? I don't know. I'll just throw a number out there. Five million dollars. Oh, no, 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 no. One point six million. Yes, oh, okay. 1.6 million for a fireboat. 1.6 million for a fireboat. Fire trucks are also expensive. It's been a while since I've seen a figure for them, but they are also expensive. But this is specialized machinery. 1.6 million. So next time you see a fireboat out on water like that, GSA may have had a role in the community getting the project, uh, getting the new piece of equipment like that. Anyway, those are all the fascinating fast facts we've got for you today. Don't forget, if there is anything else fast related that you'd like to learn about or someone you'd like to hear featured on Fast Focus, let us know. Send a note to GSA Fast Focus at GSA.gov. That is GSA F A S Focus at gsa.gov. I'm Joan Cornglith. I put the words together. Max Stempora is the producer. Domini Artist handles the social media. Thank you to Tiffany Hickson for joining us in the studio this week. Fast Focus is a production of the U.S. General Services Administration's Office of Strategic Communications.